Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Just how ugly is Britain's divorce from the EU going to be? And how damaging for the unhappy couple? As British MPs debate the formal triggering of the exit process, my guest is an EU politician who will be at the heart of the complex negotiations over a Brexit deal. Belgium's former Prime Minister and current MEP Guy Verhofstadt has warned Britain to expect no favours as it heads for the exit. But how confrontational is he prepared to be? Guy Verhofstadt, welcome to Hard Talk. Yep. I want to talk about Brexit with you, but I don't want to start with the detail. I want to start with the context. When the British public voted for Brexit on June 23rd, 2016, Barack Obama was President of the United States. Now, the White House is occupied by Donald Trump. To what extent do you think this fundamental shift in global politics, the most important power in the world, after all, mm. How important is that as a context, a changed context for Brexit? No, I think it gives an opportunity, I think, from the European side to show and to work on more unity. Because let's be honest, what uh, Trump has said uh, the, uh, uh, since now a few days and a few weeks is, is very hostile towards Europe. And he is saying openly that uh, he thinks that Europe could disintegrate Further. Yeah, he thinks more European members of the EU yeah, will exactly. follow Britain out of the exit uh, yeah. door. And he thinks he that's a good that. thing. Yeah, he thinks that it is a good thing to have a, a disintegrated European Union. While I think it's quite the opposite. The, uh, uh, in fact, the interest of the, the Americans is not in a disintegrated Union. Uh, the interest of America is to have a, a very united European ally. And uh, you can only walk on two legs. You need uh, also Trump needs an American leg. And he needs also but, a European uh, lack at the one But whatever hand. your sceptical view of Donald Trump as president and as an individual, the fact is the European Union needs to be closely allied with the United States of America. Exactly. That's one of the pillars of European security exactly. policy. And that so, is what he is uh, now uh, putting in danger, well, uh, uh, but Trump. With respect, you are too. Some of the things you've said in recent days are actually extraordinary. You have said, and you said this yesterday, uh, and I'm quoting you, under the enormous political influence of Trump's political advisor, Stephen Bannon, he sent people to Berlin to Paris to prepare the ground for similar referendum as that seen in Britain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, what evidence do you... You're essentially saying that Trump no, no. is taking active steps to undermine the European Union. Well, Steve Bannon has uh, launched uh, Breitbart also in Europe. And everybody knows that's an extreme right-wing uh, news site with promoting in fact, uh, extreme, uh, right-wing, yes, uh, radical that, that's views. That's not the Trump also, administration. I mean, you, the, you, you no, are it's saying not the Trump, these hostile so, things about <laughs> Donald Trump as what, president, which seem to me to have no evidence at all. I'm a little bit puzzled that you are saying it's not the Trump administration, where Mr. Bannon has been appointed as member of the National Security Council of the U.S. Yes, of course. Even that, putting that's outside... Job, but you, you, of, you actually even, cited it, to me yeah, something yeah, that was yeah. happening at uh, Brighton. So I think it's, a, a, a I think, I think, I think it's uh, maybe not the Trump administration, but it's Mr. Steve Bannon, the special advisor of, of, of Trump. So I, I, we, we can discuss about uh, what the influence is of Mr. Bannon on Mr. Trump. What I see is what Mr. Trump is saying. Mm. That's thought, more important. Uh, and he quote. is, uh, his, yeah, his it's quotes, a, are, his, his quotes, the, his quotes he, are very clear. He, he says, well, yeah, so are other, other, uh, yeah, I hope to be clear. I, <laughs> that's the reason why I'm <laughs> in politics. You, you, you Normally you have politics uh, of politicians, maybe here, who are trying to escape uh, to the questions. I, in my statements, are trying never mm. to escape to the questions. Yeah, well, let's think about and your choice of words. that makes it more bold, maybe. No, it makes it fascinating, your <laughs> choice of words. My view, you say, is that we have a third front that is now undermining the EU, and that third front is Donald Trump. I mean, it's this exactly. word I can come back to, hostility. You are downright hostile to what I'm not. I'm, I'm not hostile. I'm, I'm, I'm only seeing and I'm only hearing uh, what Mr. Trump is, is saying. And the, the language of so, warfare. Okay, let me explain maybe. I think that we have first of all the threat to Europe uh, by radical 
political Islam, jihadist. Secondly, I think we have a threat by Putin, uh, an autocrat in the Kremlin who tries to divide Europe already years from now. And now we have an American president who is not longer seeing the, American uni uh, the European unity as a pillar uh, for his foreign policy. And he is saying openly he hopes for a disintegration of the European Union. So I'm, I, I think we are uh, very much alone. I think that we are, for the moment, in an existential moment for the European Union. Uh, and um, I hope uh, that uh, only, uh, my, my response to this is that only European unity can be a mm. good answer. Yeah, well, to, uh, the, the, I'm mindful you've just written this book that yeah, I got. And that's my book about Europe, Europe's, Europe's last, last chance. chance. Why, why the European states, it's, it's subtitled, why the European states must form a more perfect union. Ironically, you've taken a phrase from the, the American, American Constitution. Constitution. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Uh, I think it's going to be difficult right now to persuade uh, Europeans that they should be regarding as a model the federal United States of America. But that, that's obviously... But, but, you wrote that, this yeah, before Donald about, Trump arrived in the yeah, White That's House. about Trump now. You're making... Uh, Trump is the same as, uh, as, as the American institutions. What I'm seeing is that America, for example, after the financial crisis, was capable to react immediately to that financial crisis. Uh, they did uh, a cleaning up of their bank stock, they did uh, an investment program, they did quantitative easing. Well, if I look to Europe, we are not a union, in fact. What we are is, in fact, a loose confederation of nation states still based on the unanimity rule. And we are always acting too little too late in the financial that, crisis, that, for that example, is a very in migration, in refugees. Mm. So this book, <laughs> I have to tell you, that is even more Eurosceptic than all the Eurosceptic books that have been published in the, in the United Kingdom yeah, the last Because you think the month. current formulation of the European Union simply cannot doesn't work. It now, cannot you, you've just made a very interesting point about the importance of nation states. I mean, what, what Trump is, and avowedly uh, self-confessed, American nationalist. America yeah. first okay. is his message. Yep. And interestingly, that message, which is essentially a nationalist message, yeah. is echoed across Europe in different nation states where politicians it's, are winning with a nationalist it's message. It's not echoed. It's the opposite. It, it, it was first born in Europe. Well, Nationalism has been born in Europe. Yeah, Nationalism has not been born outside Europe. And what is more over than that, I think it's a very tricky thing what is happening, that is that an American president is bidding on more nationalism in Europe. You know what nationalism in Europe means? That's not nationalism based on values, that's nationalism in Europe based on ethnicity. And what nationalism has done the last 100 years in Europe, we all know it, 20 million of deaths, victims, programs, the Shoah, all this is based on nationalism. So an American president thinking, oh, European unity is not necessary, let's go back to national identity, to ideas of nationalism, that's playing with fire in Europe. This is not America, this is Europe. Well, we had to show up. We I had the Holocaust. We well, had the, the programs. You, and the, we, you, you can. I think it's you, a fair argument. You can argument. cite uh, the events of the 1930s and 40s at me, but the, let's stick with what's happening today, and yeah, let's stick with my opening question about back. the context for Brexit. And I come back to this basic point about the the situation today in Europe. You've just seen Theresa May in the White House with Donald Trump talking about the steadfast alliance between Britain and Europe. You've heard Donald Trump saying that he is going to seek a very quick trade deal with Britain, talking in the most positive terms about Britain post-Brexit. It weakens your hand as an EU negotiator, does it not, that Britain is now looking at this very close relationship with Donald uh, Trump. I'm not, I'm not reasoning in that term. I'm not reasoning in that terms because I know that the interest of the UK is more uh, in uh, Europe than in uh, uh, in the US. You know the figures. You know the figures. 44% uh, of the export of, the, of, of Britain goes to the continent, to Europe. Only 12% goes to the US. So whatever free trade agreement is made uh, between uh, uh, the US and the UK, the main interest of the British industry, the British companies, the British workers, the British citizens, sits in Europe and is in Europe. And so uh, these negotiations will be very important, and I'm, I'm, I'm very open about it. I think that a, a, a fairness is the basic principle uh, we need to apply in these negotiations. So when Theresa May says, alongside Donald Trump, that as you, she says to Donald, as you renew your nation, we renew ours, the opportunity is here to renew the special renew relationship, the post-EU Britain and Trump's America will lead together again, 
Your response to that is? Yeah, my response was yesterday in the streets of London, I think. I have seen uh, thousands and thousands of people who would not uh, agree with this. I, I don't believe in the, in, the, in the rhetoric and in the narrative of, 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 of Trump. I think it is devastating, also for the, for, for the American economy, because protectionism, because that's also part of his uh, narrative. And how you can make a, uh, an agreement uh, between the UK, which is an, an open society who believes in, in trade, I think, uh, and, and on the other hand, an American president who is seeing every uh, yeah, trade deficit with whatever country uh, as an existential threat. And there is a trade well, deficit from the US towards the UK. Let, let, so good luck with it. I think that is more interesting uh, for the UK authorities uh, to work together on a fair partnership with the European Union, because that is the biggest market and, for the British industry. And I want to tease out what you mean by a fair partnership in a yeah. moment. But just mm -hmm. before we get to the, the detail of the negotiations which mm -hmm. you will be involved in, just one more specific point, which again, I think arises out of what we're seeing in the United States and what we've heard from Theresa May as well, and that's a question about security. So we'll get to economics, mm -hmm. but security. You know as well as I do that Britain has been a linchpin of European security. Exactly. Our armed forces are superior to most in Europe. Our intelligence services are superior to most in Europe. If you talk to people in Germany, Poland, the Baltic republics, they all say we need a close security relationship with Britain, come what may, whether Brexit that's happens also my or point. not. That's also my point. I think that we have uh, to discuss not only uh, the economic uh, partnership between uh, the UK and, uh, and the European Union, it will be necessary uh, besides that also to talk about internal and external security. And what I don't want, that is not my position. But it's leverage from the UK, isn't it? A, a minute. What I don't want, that is exactly what I wanted to say, I don't want a trade-off uh, between uh, the economic uh, discussion uh, we will do and on the other hand the question of internal and external security. I don't think it's very serious to make a trade-off between But Germany's uh, already indicated that they... Yeah, but, but let's be honest, uh, the most important thing to do on the security issue from the European side is to create a European Defence Union the fastest as possible. You, you know the figures. But if you don't have Britain, it devalues the okay, whole thing. Okay, may I give the figures? 42% uh, we spent in Europe on, on, on military. And we are only capable to do 10 to 12% of the operations of the American army. So I, I'm not a mathematician, I'm a lawyer, but I know that it means, these figures, that we are three to four times less effective. And why we are less effective? Because we don't have a European defense community. We duplicate everything 28 times between the 28 member states. So I think this whole discussion also on security, internal, externally, is a good chance to create finally what we needed already to do decades ago, that's to create a European Defence Union. Right. Well, let, let's now... That's get, also in the book. Yes. <laughs> let's get to the nitty-gritty of negotiating a complex deal with the UK on its departure from the European Union. Just some, mm. some very quick-fire practical questions. You said recently that you thought getting a trade deal within the two-year time frame was impossible. You stick to that? I think that's impossible, yeah. Everybody knows that it's impossible. Well, they don't know it's impossible in London. If you talk no, to, no, 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 if you talk no, no. to the no, no. ministers I, I, responsible, the they say it's entirely talking, possible. I'm talking with uh, know that very well what we're going to do in this 14, 15 months, but it's not two years, it's 14, 15 months. Because at the end of the process, before the end of 2018, we need to start a consent procedure in the European Parliament. Because it's the European Parliament uh, who has to give the green light for the final agreement. So we're going to start, take end of May, beginning of June, that brings us, that gives us a time frame of 14 or 15 months. What you, can you do in this 14 or 15 months? Realistically, I think the withdrawal agreement is the first thing to do. Not an easy thing, I can tell you. That, that if, to put it in common okay. parlance, that's the divorce Secondly, agreement. Before divorce you get agreement. to the new relationship, you and have then, to do the divorce. Well, yeah, and then you have also to define your new relationship, but in general terms. But do you do them in and tandem? Then, because there's a big may, debate about whether the two sets of negotiations, one about the divorce arrangements and one about the new relationship. There cannot relationship. be a discussion about. Take the treaty. The treaty, Article 50, is very clear. The treaty is saying, first of all, you start with your withdrawal agreement. So you do in the in the In the light, in the light of your... The, of the framework of the future relationship. So you need to have an idea, not more than that, about your future relationship and then you can conclude your withdrawal agreement. To continue then with, for example, if it is an FTA, uh, a free trade agreement, it will take years. It will take the uh, whole... How many, how many uh, years in your oh, opinion? I think uh, the whole period of transition. And the period of transition will be two years, three years, 
So besides the two years we have now, or the 40 or 15 months where I'm talking about, you will need the whole transition period uh, to conclude what it be the final agreement uh, with uh, the UK. That's a realistic There, there are cracks period. appearing, it seems to me, in the EU's position on some of the key fundamental principles of a, a negotiated deal. You've said the, the, the four freedoms that underpin the single market, they're not going to ever be negotiated exactly. upon and there'll be no cherry picking. Yep. Others have sent signals suggesting that there can be sector by sector deals which, while Britain leaves the single market, will allow Britain preferential access to certain sectors of that single market. Is that possible? There will be no cherry picking. Nobody of uh, the, the three institutions of the EU uh, will accept that. So Mrs. May have indicated she wants to go out of the Union, out of the single market, out of the customs union, out of the European Court of Justice, and then saying, oh, but that is a EU, a EU program that interests me, and that is a sector that interests me. That will not happen, sorry. Because then she has to take also the obligations, and the payments were linked to uh, disadvantages. You can never create a status outside the European Union what is more advantageous than to be member of the European Union. It should you, not be fair you, towards the members of the European Union and towards our taxpayers. You want to believe that there can be no cherry picking, but others have sent a, di a different message. Even Mr. Barnier, who is, with all due respect, probably more important to negotiations yeah, than you. Yeah, that's true. Because he, I am a, he's, he's negotiating a, no, on behalf of the Commission. He uh, is negotiating and we have to approve his negotiations. Exactly. So You're we all have to observe that he's a negotiator. And he, according to a leak that the Guardian newspaper got hold of, told MEPs that there needed to be no. a special relationship between yeah, no, big I finance, the, that city, has been denied. the city of That's London... That has been denied two times by well, Mr. Barnier. You know, in the nature of politics, he had to deny it because it was an unauthorised No, leak. sorry, but I was there in that meeting, and he has never said that. I was in that meeting. It was a meeting of the uh, conference of committee chairs of the European Parliament. I was present as the Brexit negotiator for the European Parliament, and he never said that. Be assured of one thing, sherry-picking, we shall not allow So it. when the German car industry, for example, pleads with the German government and says, look, be real, uh, and I'm quoting now the, the head of the Federation of German Industry, imposing trade barriers, imposing protectionist measures between the EU and Britain or between the two political centres, on the, the EU on one hand, UK on the other, would be a very, very foolish thing to do. Yeah, but that's I, a German I, I, Yeah, I agree with, uh, with, with, with all this. I'm against protectionism myself, but that's not the point. It's not the point about protection, it's, it's the point is uh, if, for example, that's in, in any way, my, I think, still the best option. That is that the UK should ask for, uh, uh, to be part of the single market, to continue to be part of the single market, at the same time accepting the four freedoms of the European Union. The problem doesn't start with the European Union, the problem starts with the UK government saying, oh, the freedom of movement of people inside the European Union, we don't like it because there are Polish people coming to work on our construction sites here in London, we don't like it. I think that these people uh, are, are very necessary in the uh, UK economy. You know what the labour mobility in Europe is? 1%. You know what the labour mobility in the US is? 10%, 10 times bigger. And w one of the reasons that we have 2 million of vacancies in Britain and in Europe is because isn't, we have not enough labour mobility. Isn't the truth, Mr. Verhofstadt, that you take the position you take, no cherry picking, no negotiation on these sector deals, you take that position because you're deeply insecure. You worry that if Britain is seeing to get a deal that works for Britain, that actually makes the British economy no. successful, that it will encourage others in Europe to follow Britain to the exit door. You're deeply insecure yeah, about the fragility I'm and vulnerability not deeply, uh, the, of the, the European Union. The, the problem Union. of the future of the European Union is not so much linkage to the Brexit negotiation. The problem of the future of the European Union is linked to the courage and the willingness of the European leaders for the moment to go forward, like I describe in this book, with the unity and the integration of the European Union, creating a defence community, creating an economic governance for the single currency, creating an external border and coast guard. So the future of the European Union is depending on that and, well, and not so much, I think, 
on you know, a Mr. fair Hofstadt, partnership You've been with writing books, with all due respect, about the need for a federal Europe for an awful long time. You wrote The United States of Europe in 2006. As Prime Minister. You wrote, you, you wrote, you wrote another book in 2009 called How, Britain, How Europe rather, Can Save the World, Emerging from Crisis. You know, you have written these books, which now look like museum pieces. No, Europe's moved I'm, on. I'm sorry, sorry. Europe's politicians so, are no well, longer I, talking exactly. about union and federation. I, I, no, it is the opposite what is happening. You are laughing a little bit with uh, my uh, books, but at the same time, I was the one who said we need a banking union before we can overcome the financial crisis. In the meanwhile, you agree that the banking union is now in place. I was how also Europe, one of the how European Europe leaders. How Europe can save the world man, was yeah. your title in 2009. Frankly, uh, exactly, Europe has done exactly, nothing to save the uh, exactly world in the last seven years. Exactly, because we didn't years. have the institutions on the European level that was necessary. I already explained to you, you we are still a loose confederation of nation states based on the unanimity rule in which we act always too little too late. And the financial crisis, I have described it in the book, is a typical example of that. And I said we need a banking unit. Today we have a banking unit. I can when tell you, you they like have laughed with me as you, prime minister mm. when I proposed a number of initiatives on the defense union. Today, these initiatives, European headquarters, for example, are on the table. When you talk like this, Mr. Verhofstadt, you play into the hands of people like Nigel Farage, one of the most important leaders of the Leave campaign in the UK, when he says you are a dangerous fanatic and he says you have long been anti-British to uh, that's, the uh, core. That's, uh, that's a, a completely nonsense. You know, I'm racing with an old car. It's a 1954 right-hand drive Aston Martin. How can you be more British than that? Well, I tell you, I tell you, <laughs> I look at your own words and I wonder about your attitude to Britain. You said in 2016, according to Politico, the website, quote, politically, the UK is already on its way to becoming an adversary rather than a trusted partner of the EU. Is so that how that you see no, the UK we, today, uh, certainly with, uh, Certainly, with, uh, that is what Mr. Uh, Farage is uh, exactly uh, standing for. When I'm attacking him, I'm attacking not Britain. I'm attacking uh, somebody uh, who wants uh, to the destroy UK the European Union. The UK is on its Union. way to becoming an adversary. Is that the way you feel about the UK No, today? absolutely not. What I'm feeling about is that we can find a fair partnership, but people like Mr Farage, uh, who are at the heart of the Brexit campaign and who are really to destroy the European Union, that's our problem. That's my uh, the, the thing what they're going to fight uh, but, but the thing it. is the thing is it's not really just about Britain is it when you said of the brexit campaign mm -hmm. you described it as the latest high mass of tribalism in Europe yeah it isn't just actually in Britain where people are expressing great skepticism about the European Union great skepticism about immigration and its effect upon Europe yep. you could look at Le Pen in France yeah, well, look well, at Wilders well, uh, in, in the Netherlands, the Netherlands. Yeah. look at Poland look at Hungary look at so yeah, many nations I, I don't deny, the European Union. I don't deny this. I'm fighting against these people. I don't deny that Le Pen exists. I don't deny that Wilders exists. But I can you, tell you one thing. The, the public opinion in, in, uh, on the continent, uh, in, in our countries, in the European Union, is not against Europe. They are against this European Union. That's exactly why I'm saying to you, this book is maybe more Eurosceptic than all other books that have been published. Because I think that this European Union will not survive. What you need to do, to convince also people that are voting today for builders of Le Pen that's offering a vision of the future, showing them that unity of Europe can tackle the financial crisis, the economic fallout of it, the migration flows, the refugees coming to Europe, the insecurity uh, externally. The federal, that is what I'm saying. You've been the federalist dream for 10 years. Yeah, At what point are again, you going to realize it is a dream exactly, and not reality? Exactly. The banking union today is a reality because we have pushed for it. I think also tomorrow European Defence Union will be a reality because the world is changing and we cannot count longer on Mr. Trump. So it will arrive. I see, for example, what's happening in France, French presidency. Macron, you're following it, what he is saying about Europe? It's a Frenchman who is saying, well, sovereignty, we don't uh, find sovereignty anymore on a national level. We need it on the European level. Let's say a Frenchman who is saying that, that's somebody you have to invite in hot talk, the forces as possible, I should say. And we'll get you back to discuss the state of Brexit in a few months or years' time. But for now, we have to end right there. Giva Hofstadt, thank you for being on Hard Talk. Thank you very much indeed.